Execution? No, absolutely no execution here, John. Not for you, anyway. I mean, conference, you know, it's... Um, when people look at politics and, and, and uh, you, you look at the leadership candidates in the um, currently going for the um, leadership of the Labour Party and listen to some of, some of their reasons why they believe that the Labour Party lost the election, um, all they've got to do is, is look at what happened in Scotland, which people keep referring to, but also look at what happens when you're a, polit a politician that has principles, that stands up for working people. When you have principles and you stand up for working people, what you do is you get elected, not just with the majority you had last time, but with an increased majority. And let's welcome, give an absolutely rapturous welcome to the re-elected MP for Hales, Hayes. Oh, forget that. John MacDonald. Thanks a lot. Can I, thanks a lot. Thanks, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Um, I am here as the chair of the parliamentary group in Parliament on behalf of the Union. We've circulated a written report to all of you about the activities of the group over the last year. And um, I believe there's time for questions after I've spoken on any of the issues you want to raise, including those in the parliamentary report. Last time, I, let me just say this though, I chair the parliamentary group, so I'm the voice of this union along with others in parliament. And I just want to say this to you, I'm immensely, immensely proud of being the voice of this union in parliament. I'm immensely proud not just being a voice in parliament, but also on every picket line, every demonstration that you've called. Because what you've done is not just represent our members effectively, but also those people up until now have had no representation, particularly in the fast food sector. You launched the campaign 18 months ago, which I think has sent shockwaves right the way through the trade union movement about how a union can effectively organize, how you can represent some of the most vulnerable workers within our society and some of the youngest as well. So I just want to thank you. First of all, thank you for the honour of being able to represent you in Parliament, but also thank you for the dis just the determination, the courage that you've shown in your representations of our own members, but also, as I say, in the, the fast food industry of the last year. Last year when I was at conference, we were preparing the agenda for the negotiations with an incoming Labour government. We had a whole list of things that we'd been talking di directly to Ed Miliband about, and to be frank, we were achieving some successes in those discussions around trade union rights, around health and safety, the, the heat campaign that we'd been waging, and we thought things were moving on. And most of us thought, if you cast your minds back, that we would most probably have a Labour government, not necessarily with a majority, but at least the largest party. And we were hoping maybe a Labour government with a, a small majority. Well, as you know, on May the 8th, it was probably one of the darkest hours for the Labour movement in this country since the Second World War, with the Tories getting back in. And we now face, I think, one of the most serious political situations that we've faced, at least since the 1980s. You'll hear from Arthur later on about, he may well take you through what happened to the working class during that period when we were struggling then under a Thatcherite government. Well, I warn you, this government is worse than anything we've ever seen under Thatcher, and more determined as well. Why did Labour lose the election? Let's just take it through. You've had some debate about that already. But basically, the most common theme on the doorstep from people who used to vote Labour, didn't vote Labour this time, wasn't, wasn't actually the phrase that people expected. It was more I didn't leave Labour, Labour left me. And we heard that time and time again right the way across the country. People disillusioned with Labour and looking for an alternative or disillusioned with Labour and staying at home. In Scotland, you know, we got wiped out. We've got one Labour MP left. He got re-elected because he supported the campaign of his local football team. It wasn't about being a Labour MP as such. And what happened in Scotland, people don't underestimate this and don't misinterpret it. The SNP won, not because they're a nationalist party, they are in some elements of it, but they won because it was a complete rejection of what new Labour over the period in office had imposed upon them. Iraq, privatisation, cutbacks, and not offering them an alternative. 
The SNP won because they were seen as the anti-austerity party. They're mildly social democratic. And the irony of it is they're implementing austerity policies in Scotland. We're having a battle through the RMT at the moment about them privatising the ferries and cutting workers' pensions. But they portrayed themselves as anti-austerity when it comes to Westminster. And let the Labour Party was seen as almost a party in occupation, a foreign country's party occupying Scotland. That's why they rejected anything from Westminster they rejected. And they mobilised like a social movement, the way the Labour Party used to mobilise, bringing people in, mobilising, recruiting, campaigning against unfairness and injustice. And do you know what was frightening as well in parts of the north of England in particular, but elsewhere as well, UKIP came second to Labour in 42 constituencies. Got four million votes, a racist party. Don't tell me they're not racist, they're racist. And they got four million votes. Why? Because of the same level of disillusionment. We never provided people with the jobs, the homes, and the security that they wanted. And right the way across the rest of the country, to be frank, when you're coming out of a recession, people want to feel confident that the incoming government is on their side. And for Labour to go into a campaign promising austerity light -like policies disillusioned whole sections of people who would normally support us. And they allowed the Tories to blame Labour for the last recession. The Tory allegation was that we crashed the economy. The problem with that is it's true. But it's tr they got the allegation true but for the wrong reasons. Labour didn't crash the economy because we spent too much money on teachers or hospitals or police officers or investing in our environment. We crashed the economy not because of overspending, but because of under-regulating. Under Brown and Blair, we went along with all the ideas about neoliberalism that you deregulate the banks and the finance houses, you allow credit to go through the roof, you do nothing about trade union rights, so wages remain suppressed, and then you get a debt bubble, and eventually someone, a family in the United States on low pay, said, we can't pay the mortgage anymore, and that went right the way across America, right the way across Europe. But we had a special responsibility in government, because we had the city of London, two miles away, well, a mile and a half from Westminster, that we allowed to completely become out of control and rip off not just the people who borrowed the money, but the whole of society. This argument that we overspent is easily disproved. In terms of the amount we spent in proportion to the GDP, the gross domestic product, we spent less than we inherited from the Tories. What happened was as soon as the crash occurred, we had to pump money into the economy to save the banks. But we saved them for who? Not for us. We put £850 billion worth into the economy and we saved them for the bankers. The bankers are back now with their bonuses, with their profits, with their huge pension schemes and even when they fail, they're still getting paid out. What I find despicable at the moment though is actually all these ministers, Labour ministers shadow cabinet, who are in the shadow cabinet now blaming and turning on Ed Miliband. They were in the shadow cabinet why didn't they stand up and say something? Why didn't they pose the alternative to austerity? Why didn't they campaign within their communities? It's too easy just to blame one man. What do we face now? This is a serious speech. There aren't many jokes. I'm sorry about this. What do we face now is an absolute hurricane of cuts, privatizations, and attacks on trade union rights and civil liberties. We've had the Queen's speech. You've been talking about some elements of it today. The trade union bill will be introduced, as you know, a balloting procedure, as someone has just said in the debate, a balloting procedure which would mean only 55 MPs would have been elected on that basis. A 50% plus 40% of the overall electorate you have to have which means if you get a turnout of about 50%, you have to have 80% of those people voting in favour. This government was elected on 25% of the vote of the electorate. This is what would anywhere else in the world would be described as an elected dictatorship. 
They have no mandate for this legislation, no mandate for this attack on our civil liberties that we've fought for and struggled for and gained as a result of two centuries of struggle and sacrifices. But it goes further on than that. I tell you, in this next five years, if they can get away with it, the NHS will have gone. In the last six months of the, the coalition government, two-thirds of all contracts in the NHS went to the private sector. And it's interesting, isn't it? It went to companies from which many Tories have got their financial interests, and unfortunately, some ex-Labour ministers are working for them. A scandal, a rip-off of the I think on a scale we've not seen before. In addition to that, as you know, what they're doing is on housing associations like council house sales, they're going to sell them off. I tell you, I represent a working class multicultural community on West London. Tonight, 200 of my families will be sleeping in bed and breakfasts. 4,000 on the housing waiting list. Only six months ago, there were 10,000, but the Tories wiped off with a calculation, a manoeuvre to take 6,000 families off it. Many of my families in my community are living in overcrowded communities, overcrowded housing. But worse still, in West London, in the seventh richest country in the world, I have people living in sheds and families living in shanties. I have a shanty town developed in London at the moment in my constituency, where whole families are living in appalling third world-like conditions. And yet, what do the Tories want to do? They want to sell off the housing associations in the same way they want to sell off council properties and deny those people any prospect of a roof over their heads. It's like going back 70 years, 60 years, 50 years. I was born in Liverpool. I haven't got the Scouse accent anymore. We moved south for work. I was born off the Scotty Road in a slum. And we celebrated the day we moved out to get a council house, Parker Morris Standards, with a garden. The families I now represent have no chance. The waiting list in my area, I mean, right the way across the country, mean people will have to wait a minimum of 10 years at the moment, but the Housing Association properties are sold. There is no hope of having a decent roof over their heads. This is a scandal, an absolute scandal, the suffering that they're imposing on our community. The budget is in a few weeks' time as well, July the 8th. £30 billion pounds worth of cuts. They're looking for £12 billion worth of cuts on welfare benefits alone. Most of that will come from working families' tax credits. Most of our members are on working family tax credits of some sort, and they're coming for child benefit as well. They've promised that they won't attack people with disabilities. Nobody believes that. So there's a debate in the Tory party now about why you're not cutting the benefit but taxing it in some form and increasing the, the stringency of the test for people with disabilities. Well, on the last figure of the number of people who got assessed ready for work under the work capability assessment, 4,000 died before they got to work. Assessed, willing, to, able to work, they die before they can take up the job. In Parliament, some of you raised it with me last time, and I raised the question on your behalf about the number of people who committed suicide as a result of the cuts in benefits. The government, there was an MP, a Tory MP, called Esther McVeigh. I won't say any more on that. I wound up in the Daily Mail last time I mentioned anything about her. <laughs> we asked her to publish the government's report monitoring the suicides of people who'd been on benefits where the coroner had indicated the benefit cut had been at least part of the reason why they died. They refused to publish them. We got a leak, well, a leak, a Freedom of Information Act request, a leak and then an FOI, and they monitored just 49. And of those 49 cases of suicide, they, dis they discovered that at least 10% were related, of the suicides were related to a cut in benefits. That means if you extrapolate that over all the figures that we've got, we're talking about literally every year, literally every year, tens, dozens, maybe up to 100 people committing suicide as a result of the cut in benefit. Is this a civilized society? Is this the sort of society that we should be living in, where the most vulnerable are forced to take their own lives as a result of these cuts, and yet they're going to pour more on them. 
But let me say this, though. The threat isn't just what's coming from the government. One of the biggest threats that I think we face is that we're about to possibly go into another recession. All the factors that were there to create the 2007-2008 recession are back again. Low pay, pay stagnating at the moment, low productivity, a, a deficit on our current account, so we're, we're actually buying more than we're selling in terms of abroad. House price assets going through the roof again. Debt increasing, not just on houses, but also people going into debt again for the basics. Evictions on a record scale this year. All of those factors now that created the 2007-2008 crisis are back again. So we're faced with a government inflicting cuts of 30 million, reducing demand in the economy. The economy, all the figures we heard before the election, now contradicted because we're going backwards and possibly into deflation rather than growth itself, and an economic crisis potentially within two years. I didn't come here to give you good news, obviously, did I? But I tell you what the good news is. In meeting and conferences like this, right the way across the country, people are actually making a determined decision. And the determined decisions are these. What do we do about this? We resist. We resist in the same way that you've resisted over these recent years. I go around, I go around the country, I don't know, maybe it's me, but everywhere I go now, there are people resisting. Candy Unwin, I was in Trafalgar Square last week on the National Gallery dispute. Group of workers, I don't think they've ever been on strike before. They're out on strike on a regular basis now. Why? Against privatisation to protect their wages. But I'll tell you one other thing as well. Out of basic solidarity to the trade union rep that represented them has now been victimised and sacked. I pay tribute to PCS for the solidarity that they've given their own members. But on that demonstration in Trafalgar Square, we had the Barnet Unison workers as well. Home carers, again, threatened with privatisation. Another group of other carers with them who'd privatised already 17% pay cut. What do they do? Some of the lowest paid workers in local government. What are they doing? They're on strike on a regular basis and they're fighting back every time. We had, we had the lecturers from the London Met, the London Met Colleges. These are lecturers, these are professional qualified people whose jobs are being casualised. Why are they being casualised? Because their contracts are being withdrawn, their wages are cut, their conditions undermined. What are they doing? They're not just striking themselves, but their students are coming out with them. And we had at the UCL, when the students were then threatened because of the solidarity that they were doing, what did they do? They went on rent strike against the university. Right the way across the piece. Come to London sometime. I'm describing it as a rebel city at the moment. People fighting back. Housing occupations taking place. Squatting started again because there's nowhere else to go. That's why the Tories made squatting more a criminal offence in the last legislation. And do you know what happened? The youngster down in Brighton, turfed out of the accommodation, threatened with criminal action, froze to death this winter on the doorstep. Read it. Where do we read it? Right there across the media? No, not at all in the Daily Mirror and the Morning Star. Again, what's been happening in the squatters movement now, families saying we're not going to be evicted by landlords anymore, we're staying put, and whole communities then surrounding them to support them. So I say what we've got to do now is be part of that resistance movement, part of that resistance movement. And we have a special responsibility as a union now to make sure, first of all, our own members are fully educated about what's happening. <clears throat> we expose to them the crisis that this country is in, the attack that's coming at us from the Tories. But also, what we need to be doing, exactly as we have done the last year or two, with, through our political education mechanism, the way we run our courses, etc., not just talk about how bad it is, but what alternatives there are. We've got to give people the vision of a future society, an alternative that the Labour Party failed to do at the last election. Because in that way, we can give people confidence. Can I say also, when we work together, we're stronger. That means, and we as a union have always done this, we've always worked in solidarity with others. When other unions are in dispute, if we can assist them, we do. But you know, in this coming period, 
If they get the trade union rights bill through, you know what they're going to do. They're going to target PCS as civil servants. RMT they detest. The RMT have become the miners now like the miners were in the 1980s. The FBU because of their continuing campaign over pensions. And if they can break them, they'll come to break us. So I think one of the things we should be saying to the TUC now is that when we campaign together, we're stronger. When we strike together, we're undefeatable. So therefore, the TUC needs to play its role now in coordinating activity. <coughs> and let me say this as well. We need to link up with all those other struggles. It doesn't matter now whether people are in a union or not. We want to recruit them, but if they're not with us at the moment, let's go alongside them. So if there's a housing campaign, if there's students, whoever it is in resisting, we should be with them. So on June the 20th, on the People's Assembly March, we've got to make it the biggest protest that we've seen in decades to get people out there against austerity. And let me just say this in terms of politics as well. Tony Benn used to say, there's not enough socialists, but there's too many socialist parties. I think it's time we started getting together. Instead of fighting one another, let's have one common front against austerity. Let's start working together, and maybe from that, we'll get an electoral formation that could prove to be effective. I actually say now as well, I'm convinced of, I, up until very recently, I've been always a first-past-the-post person. Now I'm convinced about the need for proportional representation. We can't have a situation where large numbers of people are voting and not represented. That's why I think we should be considering now and talking through the alternatives to this voting system so we all have a democratic voice. But in the meantime, that might well then assist us in emerging a, I think, a political formation that will be more direct in its socialist commitment and at the same time be able to represent us better. But in the meantime, we have to fight with the resources that we've got. We're currently in the middle of a Labour leadership election. Up until last week, to be frank, there were three candidates, four candidates. You couldn't put a cigarette paper between them. So on the left of the Labour Party, there was a decision taken that we should run a Labour leadership candidate this time. I've done it twice. I don't fancy another bed of nails, quite honestly. And I had a heart attack two years ago, and I think that's the association with this union that most probably did it, but there you are. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. But the... Um, so we decided, Jeremy Corbyn decided he fancied a chance, so we're back in Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn is a principled socialist. We, are, we have until next Monday to get 35 nominations. We need, to be frank, as much pressure on Labour MPs to nominate as we can mobilise this week. I'm grateful for this union support for Jeremy. But all of us individually, we need to be contacting our local Labour MPs or Labour MPs close to us or anyone we know to tell them to nominate. We're not even asking them to vote for Jeremy at this stage. Just to nominate so we can have at least a voice against austerity on that ballot paper. That's all we're asking for. To be frank, the rules of the Labour Party leadership campaigns, and I've been through two of them, make FIFA look democratic. I've just, we're just asking, we're just asking for the Labour Party to give us a choice. And Jeremy Corbyn on the ballot paper would open up the debate and give rank and file Labour Party members the opportunity of hearing an alternative in the campaign and possibly voting for it. And I say this, if Jeremy does get on that ballot paper, we're not there just as a token, we're not there just to debate, we're there to win. We're there to win, because we want a socialist government. We want a Labour government committed to anti-austerity. We want a Labour government that actually represents the working class again. Now, they're saying in some ways that will alienate Middle England. Well, actually, I represent a London constituency. I've campaigned right the way across London and the South East. What people want is a Labour, Labour as a Labour party back again. They want Labour to build the homes for themselves and their children. They want secure jobs. They don't want to be dependent on the City of London. They want to manufacture jobs back again, decent jobs, skilled jobs. They want education for their children without having to go into debt if they want to go into university. And they want to live in a decent environment. It's not much to ask, but it's something the Labour Party was founded to deliver. And that's what Jeremy will be standing for when he stands for leader. 
So let me say this in conclusion. Yes, in many ways, politically, this is for us some of the, one of the darkest of times. But there is light at the end of that tunnel. It's one of the worst of times, but actually one of the best of times. Because it means now we can't just sit on our hands anymore. We've got to fight back. We've got to resist. If we don't, there'll be nothing left of what our forefathers and mothers before us created for us. There'll be nothing left of the welfare state. We'll be living in a society so unequal it will reflect the 18th century and not the 21st century. And I have to say as well, we'll be leaving for our children no future whatsoever. So what do we need? I come back to it again, and you know it better than me. Three things. Courage, because it's tough. The courage of people like Candy Unwin, all of us have to display. When they come for you, stand up. Determination, absolute determination. We're going to win. Doesn't matter what they throw at us, we're going to win. They're the few, we're the many. We control. If we don't work, they don't earn. In fact, at the end of the day, we control this economy, not them. And we can control the electoral system as well with our votes because we're the many, they're the few. But above all else, what do we need? Why were we founded? We were founded on the principle of solidarity. We need solidarity with every resistance struggle in this country. Solidarity, brothers and sisters. Okay, conference. We're going to take a couple of questions. So, if there's anybody, and it's, it's, it's going to be literally about two questions because uh, obviously we're getting near uh, half past twelve. So, is there anybody who wants to ask John any any question? Any bird about? We've got one. One more. I'll take one more. Two. I didn't see you there. Marilyn, come down. We'll ask for you. Marilyn, come down. Oh, see, I, I'm a coward. I know where my bed's buttered. I know where my bed's buttered. So, Pat, John, Marilyn. Pat Rowley, <coughs> Mr. President, delegates. John, welcome, and it's great to see you at our conference. My question is Does politics need cleaning up. Is it too immoral? I, I read here by a minister, McShane, who got jailed for fiddling his expenses. But when he came out, he said he was glad that pre-2010, all expenses belonging to MPs were shredded. Haven't we a right to know that these people are doing wrong? And haven't we a right to have them taken out of office? Uh, it's your to tell us what you think on that, John. We'll ask, ask the questions and then, then John will answer them. John Vickers, um, full-time official. One of the issues I've got, John, is we've got to bear in mind is before we get all excited and giddy and making all these demands, we've got to bear in mind in this room today there are probably delegates who actually voted Conservative, delegates that actually voted UKIP. And it's okay getting on this wave of euphoria. What we've got is we've got issues within ourselves to, res to sort of get across. And, and finally, is one of the things that really does concern me is one of the things that's actually going around on Facebook is a photo of um, Houses of Parliament, and that's beauty about it being televised, you can actually see. And when it comes to a debate on national minimum wage, there are maybe 10, 15, at most 20 MPs from either side in Houses of Parliament talking about national minimum wage. When it came to MPs' salary debates, they were crammed in like sardines, because it was like it, it was it were a case. It was a case that they got the, we were talking about how deep they could get this, the snouts into a trough. What are we going to do to get the message across to people that we, we, we're actually trying to target that Labour Party MPs 
I'm, I, I've got morals, I've got principles, and they're not in there to get the noses as deep as they can into, into trough. That's an issue we've got to tackle. Marilyn McCarthy, 450 Branch. Until two years ago, John, I lived in Oldham, an industrial town. Our MP was Michael Meacher, I think he still is, son of a merchant banker. So he definitely had a lot in common with the Oldham people. And he never, ever came and knocked on my door in the 30 years that I lived in the same house. Nobody from the Labour Party ever came and knocked on my door. What are these people doing? He's not in that brochure. He doesn't um, support the Bakers Union. Parkgate Bakeries is in Oldham, in his constituency. What sort of MPs have we got? That's one. Secondly, my MP now, because now, I've now moved to Salford, the city of Salford on the outskirts of Manchester, and our MP is Graham Stringer, another one that doesn't know to knock on doors, and his name's twice in that book. These are not what I would call Labour MPs. They're out of touch with us. I've got to say, Mel, I wouldn't have knocked on your door either. I'd have been scared. John. Okay. <laughs> Let me just pat raise the important question of cleaning up politics. Let's be clear. I'm sta it's a scandal that they have seem to have eradicated the evidence from the expenses scandal that was exposed. Well, that's, been rep that's what's been reported. And what I can't find, what I find absolutely amazing, is only a few went to prison. Only a few. And they weren't the worst examples of the expenses that were claimed. Remember, even David Cameron had to pay back money for the gardening that he claimed that was illegally claimed. It is extraordinary that how they closed that whole scandal down so quickly. But that isn't just the scandal, is it? It's all the other jobs that they do as well. And then when they stand down as ministers, how companies that they've awarded contracts to as ministers, within 18 months or two years, they become directors of the boards of those companies. And that isn't just Tories, that's ex-Labour ministers as well. I think we should follow Dennis Skinner example. If you're an MP, that's your one job. One job, that's all you should have. You shouldn't have any outside jobs. And if if you're a minister, and if you're a minister and you stand down, you're no longer a minister, you should not be allowed, not just for a period of 18 months or whatever, not to have a directorship in a company that's been associated with your department. It should be permanent. You shouldn't be allowed to take up those jobs and consultancies. And in addition to that, you know as well, in my constituency, if someone's caught fiddling a couple of quid on welfare benefits, they're interrogated under the Act, you know, the, the SOCPA and all the rest of it, and then often they're prosecuted, dragged through the courts, named and shamed in the papers, and some of them then go to prison. I'm not defending people who fiddle the welfare benefits or anything like that, but in comparison with what MPs happen to MPs, and the bankers as well, where we've never seen a banker go to prison for what they've done in crashing the economy, it's a scandal, isn't it? What's a, the law that applies to one should apply to everybody, and that includes MPs as well. John's made a good point. John Wick has made a really good point. We've got to really think carefully about not just other people who voted UKIP and Tory, but our members as well. That's why I raised in my speech the important role we've got as a union to educate our members, expose how our system works, so they're educated about that, how they're being ripped off, how they're being exploited, who's doing that, who their parliamentary representatives are, but in addition to that, get our members involved in discussing the alternative that we want to see. Our union has been very effective at political education, but we've got to really recognise right the way across the trade union movement now, that's one of our roles. Because we can't have people, to, we used to call it false consciousness, where they go and vote against their own class interests, and that's what they're doing. And it's easy, isn't it? In, in every recession, someone comes along, some demagogue, demagogic politician, and blames a scapegoat. In the 30s, the fascists blamed the Jews. In the 50s and 60s, actually, it was my lot. The Irish got it for a bit in this country. Then it was the blacks, then it was the Asians. And in this recession, it's immigrants 
or anyone on welfare benefits. UKIP targets the immigrants, the Tories can't target the welfare benefits. We've got to explain to people that these are scapegoats. It's not the individuals that are causing the problems that we're suffering. It's the system itself and those who control the system. And their representatives in Parliament are the Tories and their representatives are UKIP. Well, I think that's the role of political education that we do. And in terms of parliamentary debates, let me just say this. In terms of our group, I've been proud of the way we've represented this union in Parliament, turning up at debates, engaging in them and all the rest. Obviously, we have to prioritise. We're a small group. We prioritise who can get where. But it's, it is interesting, isn't it? When we were campaigning on the minimum wage and the living wage and £10 an hour, we got some support, but not enough. Every MP that's associated with any trade union in this country now, we should have committed to £10 an hour as a minimum wage. Full stop. <laughs> and I just... I, don't get me going on the MP's salary increase, because I just... My heart won't take it, quite honestly. But it's a, isn't it a scandal that the one time the government's going to impose by the looks of it other pay freezes right the way across the board, those same MPs are going to vote themselves through. Well, not vote themselves through, because it's done independently now, but virtually do nothing about having a 10% increase up to, what, 74 grand or what, whatever it is. My view is all of them should now say we're not having it, full stop. Keep it in there and spend it on what's needed, the NHS or something else. Marilyn, let me just tell you this. Um, I'll speak to Michael Meacher and Graham Stringer. I'll try and get them both to knock on your door. You might not enjoy it, but you might, it'll be worthwhile. But I tell you, in my constituency, in the general election, we, we knocked on every door. It was knackering. It was absolutely knackering. We knocked on every door. It was a hard, gruelling campaign. But we don't just do it at election campaigns. We do it all the time. And I correspond. I had one woman in a public meeting the other day saying, have you... You've written to my husband six times. Are you having an affair with him or something? You know, it was like that. And that's, that's what we're about, aren't we? Representing people. We've got to be, the Labour Party and all of us now, we've got to be a social movement once again, where we work together as a community. No one, even if they're elected into different positions, they're no different from anyone else. They should be just working class people, which comes to my final point. As a union, we've been trying to encourage our members into political education and all the rest of their good trade union reps. We've also been saying to our members, think about standing for position, standing as a local councillor, standing for parliament, because we want working class representation back in parliament, because in that way we can get true representation with people who know what it's like to struggle to pay the rent, not able to actually afford things that they, uh, their kids want. We want people in there who have life experience, not people who have been parachuted into constituencies and all they've done is go to university and then become policy advisors. We want working class representation again and this union can spearhead that campaign. Solidarity. <laughs>